This is the Lammer College Academic Speaker Series. My name is Lynn Jay. I'm a professor in the Liberal Studies Department. Um, we're really excited about our speaker today. Uh, I also want to welcome our BCTV audience. Um, and this presentation will be available for viewing on BCTV if you'd like to see it again. Um, to introduce, oh, I want to say if you could just check to turn off your phone and silence it. That would be really helpful. Um, introducing our speaker tonight is Meredith Robertson, who is an intern for the Center for Neurodiversity Nerd here at Denver College. Ooh. Meredith? Uh, hello, everyone. I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of ones I don't recognize, so that's super exciting. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Academic Speaker Series and the Center for Neurodiversity at Landmark College to introduce our super exciting guest speaker, uh, Ms. Jennifer Cook. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, she is a super amazing autistic advocate and she's also an author of a lot of books including the best-selling Asper Kids uh, series, which um, I know is something that personally means a lot to me. I had um, that book, the, the I think it's technically the second one in the series, but the Ask for Kids Secret Guide to Social Rules. Um, and I got that book in fifth grade and throughout middle school and high school, it kind of served as a Bible to help me translate social rules. So I know that book and that series is near and dear to my heart. So for that reason, I'm very excited to have uh, Ms. Cook here today to be telling us all about her experience. Um, she also wrote the best-selling memoir, Autism and Heels, which um, right after this presentation, we'll be having a book signing for. And if you don't have your own copy of Autism and Heels, you will be able to purchase that. So that is super exciting. Um, also, just another thing, event later in the day, for the students in the room, the Center for Neurodiversity's um, kind of affiliated club, the Neurodiverse Brains Club meeting from eight to nine, Jennifer agreed to visit, so that's gonna be super exciting and that'll be really fun for our discussion. Um, but for everyone, this presentation is gonna be super exciting. Um, and I think there's just one more announcement that's super exciting that Jennifer wanted everyone to know, which I know I'm over the moon about, which is for those of you who are familiar with the TV show, Love on the Spectrum um, on Netflix, it's a super awesome TV show, uh, in their upcoming series, uh, Jennifer is one of the guest consultants on the show. So that's something to look forward to. And I know something I can't wait to watch. Uh, so I guess without further ado, Jennifer Cook. Thank you for having me. Is, is, is the mic on? Yes? OK. Usually I can hear myself a little too loudly in my own ear. And so I'm going to just open my water and say thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you to Landmark, first of all. Um, but also just thank you to each one of you for taking time out of your evenings to be here. Um, I know it's, it's not easy. You've got everybody here has got a lot going on. And so just know that it's appreciated. Um, I flew in from Charlotte last night, and uh, it's, it's, I'd love to say warm welcome, because it's a little chilly for, for me, but, it, but the welcome that I've received here on campus has just been fantastic. So before I go further, um, only at one point during the talk, I'm going to ask for, when I say volunteer, it's literally I'll ask you like a question, and it's not a personal question. Is there anybody who would not be comfortable with that? Thank you, thank you. Okay, I will make sure not to, not to do that. And if I come near you, just be like, eh, eh, you forgot already, lady, it's okay. <laughs> Senility setting in. Also, I'm gonna tell you this. I talk, well, I don't mean speak, I present um, like somebody on the spectrum often will, as somebody on the spectrum myself. And that is, I speak linearly. So, right, I'm getting nods. I do not tend to go like, here's the subject, here's what I'm gonna tell you, this is what we're all told we're supposed to do, right? The five paragraph essay, here's what I'm gonna tell you, here are my examples, and here's what I told you. 
This is a clear and concise way of presenting information. It is not how I work. It is not how my brain works. Do not be surprised at any one point if I am telling a story that looks like it has nothing to do with the slide. I tell stories, that's the way it goes. And I will say, um, I've written, well, I guess now it's about to be the eighth book. Um, the book that Meredith was, was talking about is coming out in its 10th, 10 year anniversary edition, which is I, I, crazy that, that this has been going on um, in my life for 10 years. Um, and you'll hear more about, about that. Um, but I tend to be, I tend to speak in metaphors. And when the only like official complaint I've ever read about my work is that I use too many metaphors for someone on the spectrum to understand. Which, being that I am someone on the spectrum, seems a little weird for me. I don't know about you, because I understand what I'm saying. So, um, and also pff, to anyone who says that we can't understand it. So, <laughs> so I wanna tell you a little story about heels and specifically a pair of red heels and why they kind of have a special place in my heart. Please tell me that most of you, I know you're like 12 years old, but have seen or are familiar with The Wizard of Oz. Yes? Okay, so if I say ruby slippers, we know what I'm talking about. All right, that makes me happy, thank you. I was a little, little worried. Okay, good. What I want you to think about is the ruby slippers that everybody was chasing after, that everybody wanted, right? And really, were they a good thing? Because I'm gonna go with no. If you're Dorothy, let's think about it. You've got these prized, glittery, kind of cool, somewhat gauche fashion statement, right? And you were now attached to something which you've received without asking for, quite frankly, which people have got judgments about, for sure, um, which, if you think about it, probably pinched, gave her blisters, and sent the poor girl running around from flying monkeys. All right? Not a good start to your day. But here's the thing. When she gets to the end of the journey, do you remember, does anybody remember what the wizard or what she learns from Glinda the Good Witch? She learns that she must um, help herself. Um, she needs to, she can't always, she must learn it for herself how to get home. She had the power all along. You're 100% right, mm -hmm. 100%. So she had the power with her all along, yeah? Now, if I were Dorothy, there's a good part of me that would be like, seriously? You made me go all this way, again with the blisters and the flying monkeys, heels on cobblestones, red brick, I mean yellow bricks, not good, all right? Twisted ankles, probably. Falling asleep in a drug-induced coma, none of this is good. But if Dorothy hadn't gotten stuck with these heels, she never would have met Cowardly Lion. She never would have met the Tin Man. She never would have met Scarecrow. She never would have made unlikely friends who had their own challenges. She never would have gone on a journey to discover that in fact she had the power all along. So however uncomfortable, however messy, however gauche that journey may have seemed and those shoes may have seemed, the reality is that in the end, it's because of those shoes and where it, they took her that she realized the power, like you said, was within her the whole time. The very thing that made her stand out in maybe a, a not so good, easy to love way, heck, it made her enemies, really, right? That was her superpower. I'd like to think that all of us, though many of us walk around thinking it's what's different about us that makes us maybe not worthwhile sometimes, certainly has probably gotten us, maybe not chased around by flying monkeys, but maybe bullied or felt that we didn't belong, felt that we weren't good enough, felt that this road was endless, where am I gonna get? And oh yeah, by the way, nobody's here to help you because when you get there, it's a, an illusion right at the end. None of these things would have happened 
none of these things will happen for us unless we realize that sometimes it is that which seems to be our greatest weakness, which is in fact our greatest strength. So I present to you autism in heels, red heels. <laughs> thank you, I, use, I do that too, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, that is a picture of me, by the way, telling that precise story. Um, and I, you know, see, this is such a special place I can tell these little stories. That's me telling this story in front of Queen Elizabeth's daughter-in-law. Thank you very much. And the reason I tell you that is because autism, can it hold you back? Well, it can get in the way sometimes. I mean, like, let's be honest, autism ain't for sissies, right? But in my life, and I was only diagnosed 10 years ago, people, okay? So most of you, if you're here and you're on the spectrum, or you're here and you love people on the spectrum or teach people on the spectrum, whatever the heck the case may be, you're like so far ahead of me. And that's great because autism has taken me to, let's see, two royal families um, in Europe, the White House, National Institutes of Health. I have a doppelganger on Sesame Street, y'all, which is like the coolest and way cooler than the White House, I'm just saying, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is better than anything, um, right? To almost every state in the country, I'm getting to color off Vermont now um, because I hadn't spoken here yet. <clears throat> You'll be surprised, but give it the chance and autism will be like Dorothy's red slippers or can be for you. It can be the thing that takes you everywhere, okay? And that's me telling that same story. And they thought it was good too, so thank you for the snaps here at least. somebody. <laughs> But what I want to tell you today is, because we're talking about um, today, autism as it presents, looks in, now, this is important language things. Oh, yes. Okay. Because you're going to hear me just say, for abbreviation, I'm going to say women. I don't just mean cis women. Okay? So I don't just mean people who were assigned that at birth. Um, in fact, I've been, it's been really, really cool for me in giving this presentation how I've had people who are trans, both going male to female and female to male, who have said, oh yeah, no wait, that totally resonates with me. So, as well as people who are non-binary. So, there really is a, an incredibly rich intersection of nature and nurture that I think deserves to be unpacked and teased apart. But what I love is that regardless of pronoun or lack of pronoun, doesn't even matter, right? Like, the things I'm going to tell you seem to resonate with anyone who basically isn't cis male. And even if you are, even if you are, you're still gonna find yourself in some of this stuff. Guess what? You wanna know why? Because we're all on the human spectrum before anything else. That's why, okay? So, what I wanna tell you though is the story of a secret. And this secret is not a secret that is kept from you, as much as generally kept from the secret keepers themselves. You see, they don't even realize that there is more to their own stories. And Tim, I'm gonna ask you if you will just give me time checks, by the way, because I don't, okay, great, thank you. Thank you, okay. You see, after most talks that I've given, and we're talking around the world, we're talking in places where most people in the audience don't speak my language, you know. I have people follow me to the bathroom, which seems weird, but come on, how often do we hear the whole stereotype, well, women go to the bathroom in groups anyway, right? But what happens is, I'll get followed. And that sounds spooky, but it's not. It's because people show up to talks and they are often there because they think anyway that they're there for their husband, for their students, for their son, for their brother, for their nephew, for, right? But do, do we hear the trend that I'm giving you, right? And it's not that they're there for their daughter. It's not that they're there for themselves. They're there for all these other folks. And that's a noble reason to be somewhere and to spend time listening to some redheaded chick. 
but there's more to it. And when they hear the story of autism in heels, when they hear some of the things that I'm going to share with you today, the reaction and response is almost always that the people who are following me to the bathroom begin the stories or their sentences with something along the lines of, excuse me, I'm so sorry to bother you, but everything I just heard, I, I think, I think maybe that's me. Every single time. Now, I'm not putting pressure on anyone to follow me to the bathroom tonight. <laughs> Feel free. Personal space. It's okay. <laughs> but it's 100% true. There are lots of reasons that that's the case. One of them, oh yes, I did say language. So one of them is that I think sometimes um, we conceive of autism as, well, Maybe I'm autistic, or maybe he's autistic, or even she's autistic, but, but I'm not autistic like that, right? It's kind of like saying, I'm not, I'm not a person like that. Well, how does the like that feel, right? That doesn't feel very nice. Okay, so when you hear me talk, you will hear me have just a couple rules on language. I am not, I realize, stringently, strongly, with great fervor, that it matters to some people very much whether I say a person with autism, a person living with autism, an autistic person, I realize that language, language has power. I get that. I get that. I went to Brown. Trust me. Like, we do liberal. I know language, okay? But, but and, sometimes I think it can get in the way of being able to have conversations because people get so scared about, am I going to say this in a way that offends, rather than can I please just ask my question because I want to understand more, which I think is the bigger issue, right? People want to understand more. So I'm going to, if I, were, if I were speaking to you, you know, Meredith, we were having conversation, right? And I knew that you want to be called, you know, um, it's Robertson was your last name, yeah, right? Robertson Meredith instead of Meredith Robertson, I will do my dangdest. Like, what kind of rude person would I be like, no, I'm not going to call you that, right? Like, that would be ridiculous. I'm going to do my very best to try to be respectful. In the same way, I ask that you offer me the respect of my choice to not really have a choice. It doesn't matter to me if I'm calling the person with autism an autistic person, blah, 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 blah. It, it, it was, I was diagnosed with Asperger's at the time. That's not even a thing now. Like, it doesn't matter. It really just doesn't matter to me. That's why neurodivergent works for, for so many reasons. But I want to just kind of put that there. The only language thing that you'll hear me go <laughs> to is high functioning, low functioning. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's icky. It's just like, Gross, it makes you feel gross. Um, and the reason that I, if in case, in case you're a person who's not entirely sure why that is, and because I know most of the time that people use the lang when people try to use the language, high functioning, low functioning, or you know, they're doing it for a good reason. They're trying most times to try to be able to explain the support needs that maybe somebody requires. They're trying to explain maybe the relationship that they've had with autism, that they are familiar with, and so the context in which they understand autism. And again, I don't want to shoot the messenger. If you have genuine questions, I want you to be able to ask genuine questions without worrying about it for Pete's sake. <clears throat> that being said, right, there was a panel I was on. Um, it was an international self-advocacy panel. And there were, I don't know, five of us up there. <clears throat> I was the only woman. Thank you very much. Uh, not really, thank you. That was sarcasm. I'm going to put that out there because sometimes, you know, us and sarcasm. But OK, so. <laughs> um, but next to me was someone who was in a wheelchair and um, was, not, OK, say so again, nonverbal, perhaps preverbal, differently verbal, differently expressive. Like, again, you, there are so many ways to express what is. Anyway, a more classically presenting autistic person, yes, what people would have thought of in the olden days, if you will. And they handed me the mic, and I was the first one to get the, the question, which was, what's the hardest part about being on the spectrum? 
And my answer, in case you're curious, was always wondering how can I be so smart and feel so stupid at the same time? I don't know if anybody's ever felt that way. But that was my answer. This young man next to me used his iPad and typed out. He had a verbal IQ in the 150s, so that's genius range, high genius, okay? Verbal, verbal IQ in the genius range. And this is a person who cannot use his mouth to speak. But it's how he could, pro he could process language just fine, thank you. And he was making the point that every day he had to try to communicate to people that he was not cognitively impaired, that he just couldn't get the dang words out. And I would imagine every one of us here has had a moment when you're, you know, you got that idea and you just like, you can't quite get it out there. And you may not be in the same predicament that he is, but you understand that feeling. Just blow it up. Okay, those language markers being my rule. That's oh, my point was that if you call, you would have been called low functioning. I would have been called high functioning. Yet here's a man whose verbal IQ is higher than mine. So pfft, on that, like you just, it doesn't, it doesn't wash. Um, I like to say more obviously in need of support because even that we all know that you can be less obviously in need of support and need that dang support. Right? Okay, so that's my little thing, and we go back to the secret, and all that stuff plays into the secret. That secret of, I'm not keeping this from you, I've been keeping this from me without realizing it, I think this matches up. And the moments that we can maybe recognize from life, those whispers, and you have to wonder, are they whispering about me? Is it about me? Is, am I being left out? I'm, you know, literally being, feeling like you're the only one in the playgrounds? <laughs> who doesn't quite fit in, or oftentimes being a caregiver and, be, as I said, being there so totally for someone else that you're, re you're not realizing that, in fact, you could be there for yourself. You'll hear, I have three children. Right now, they are a senior in high school. Um, that's my daughter. Um, I have two sons then also, one who is in um, a fr his freshman year of high school and one who's in seventh grade, which just... Nobody has a good seventh grade, like, <laughs> right? Um, but I was diagnosed after them. So you'll hear that bit. But the thing is, and every single person who comes to me says this in one form or the other. I'm sure I'm the only one, and I hate to bother you. Each of us think that we're the only one. So we're busy all the time trying on masks and costumes, and sometimes quite literally, trying on different clothing and persona, personas, right? Unsure of what's real. The only one, as I said, who feels so smart, but so stupid. Oversensitive, hmm? bossy, and above all, really hard to love. And that, well, that feels lousy. And this is where I get to say, not only are you not the only one, but if you knew how many only ones I get to hear from, because all that you know about your life may be true, right? And, and there is still so much more truth that you don't know. Here's the thing, Hans, Asperger studied boys. Okay, he did. This is, this is a fact. I am standing in front of a room full of people. This is a fact, right? It is neutral, really. It is where this began, where things began. And there he is, studying boys. In Austria, in Nazi Germany. Or, well, the German Empire, Reich. Um, and we know now that he did some really awful things in connection with that. But what he did that wasn't awful was that he noticed trends, right? If you hear the word syndrome, it just means a constellation of things that are unrelated but put together that make a picture. 
it's literally like a constellation. Like you look up in the sky and the stars that make Orion or the stars that make your zodiac sign don't actually make a picture, right? I mean, if you, you know, if you viewed those same stars from the moon, you wouldn't have that same picture. It's all about perspective, right? Okay. Well, what he saw was these groups of boys who exhibited certain traits, shall we say. He noticed that they had some similar behaviors. And that's what he was looking at, primarily. He was looking at their behaviors, right? That's important. Again, the boys, only boys. This is not bad. Men, those who identify as, you guys rock. Like that's not, this is nothing personal, right? But here's what, and it's not really that surprising. Those of us on the outside of the, shall we call it, pink door, or anything that doesn't fit, are still left outside. Because in observing, right, in observing these boys, he put together a profile, a constellation of things that he saw that were similar. And it made this picture that then became called autism. And that picture is the common vernacular, the common thing that we all understand when we con conceive of autism. I could describe this is, this is a chair, right? And this is a chair, and this is a chair here. Okay, and if that is what you take away, that is what chair is, what the heck is this thing? It folds up, it doesn't swivel, it doesn't match, right? He observed, you know, boys doing specific things that he said that he noticed as being, shall we say, peculiar. But the rest of us, the rest of us with similar needs, and this is where I need my little volunteers, were left out. And I get that feeling of being left out. That'd be me. And that would be one of the hardest moments of my life that turned into one of the most okay, now what moments of my life. As I mentioned to you, my three kids, and this is 10 years ago, so 11 years ago, actually, so subtract, we've got, I had littles at that point, were being identified as being on the spectrum. My dad had recently passed away. My dad was like the classic absent-minded professor. You know what I mean? Like brilliant guy who rocked back and forth when he talked to people, who on more than one occasion during a party went into the women's room, not because he was like being sketchy, but because he was so full of social anxiety that he wasn't really paying attention to where he was going and then he'd kind of get lost in space and end up in the totally wrong place, that kind of thing. Brilliant, but, would, but was absolutely paralyzed. My parents played um, bridge for, with other couples for like 20 years. And you know what? Still, he would have to ask before they went, you know, who went with who? Because he would, now I know it was some degree of facial blindness. He couldn't remember who was who that he was seeing, even though he knew known them for 20 years. How did that feel to my mom? Like he didn't care, right? Like this didn't even matter to him because if it were work, it would have mattered. Nope, he probably would have just had better notes. Well, what happened that day was that I had started to see a pattern. And I don't know about you, but a lot of those of us who are on the spectrum, patterns are kind of our thing, right? And, and you see them in the coolest, most wild places. Like you can hear one little, one little phrase musically and then later on recognize it in a completely different part of the same show or piece, right? And all of a sudden it's just like recognizing a phrase in one part of a book and then you're, there's a major theme later. I don't know, this is how my brain works. And I'm seeing people nod, so that makes me happy. I'm not, not alone, thank you. I had seen this pattern. I, I recognized my dad clearly in my kids. I recognized as I was learning about them, how that reflected on my dad, how he had clearly fit this kind of profile. And I thought to myself, self, if he did, then maybe as the genetic link between the two, maybe all of my experiences in life 
where I had felt or been told flat out that I was hypersensitive, that I was difficult to make friends with, or um, why didn't the people that I wanted to be friends with wanted to be friends with me? Um, or I don't have an answer to that. Sorry, that's not a question a kid knows the answer to. Or the butt of every single bullying prank you can pull on people, right? That kind of thing. Why was it that I felt like the outsider looking in so often? Like even if people were together and laughing, and they may be laughing, looking, turning and looking at me thinking, hey, I wish she'd come over. To me, I see laughing and looking at me and going, okay, they're probably laughing either about me or I don't know what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go and walk the other direction. I don't know if any of this is sounding vaguely familiar. Yes, okay. And there was, there was a gift in the possibility that my differences, that my glitches, that my moments of forever feeling so smart but so stupid, maybe there was a reason for it. And it wasn't just because I was either being lazy or didn't care or whatever, or was stuck up or whatever the heck the case may be. Maybe I actually couldn't do differently. Maybe this link made sense because it was me. And that would make things a whole lot better because it would give a gift of forgiveness to me. And that day, their dad came home and told me something. He said that he had, been, he had gone to um, a psychologist at the same practice where they had been diagnosed, and he was going to try to talk about like how to better parent kids who were different and blah, blah. And he came home and said, so I've been diagnosed, I'm on the spectrum. Pardon my French, but damn it. I, was, I went outside to the proverbial suburban minivan, sat down and bawled. Not because I was scared for him, not because I felt badly for my children, but because I was jealous as all get out. And I thought, there it was. It was within reach. It was like right there, my answer. And then it was gone. And I thought, I will never, ever be anything now more than their caregiver, their helper, their partner. But I will still always be the one making mistakes and stepping in it with no real, with no good reason for it. Hmm. Or maybe, or maybe it could be an and. If you walk out of here taking, I don't know, hopefully maybe three nuggets with you, one of them is this. It has nothing to do with autism. Try in your language, try in your thoughts to say and every time you want to say but. Like if I said to you, hey, Will, that was a great tour that you took me on earlier, but. Why, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but I was, whatever I just said, the but just negated everything, right? That's all you're going to walk away feeling is the what, what did I do wrong? But if you can change that, I am trying to negate the stuff I just said before, so now it's okay. And if you can change that, if you can as often as possible say, it was a great tour, and I'm also wondering blah, 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 whatever it is, you can recalibrate the possible. You will be amazed what it does for your communications with your loved ones, with your significant others, with your friends. It is, it's like, like a superpower. It also happened to work really well for me because it turned out in my world, I was an and, not a but either. And I shall explain, but what I was, not just a highly or high functioning, which is how they would have seen me, person. But I was just highly camouflaged. And in that reason, or for that reason, my challenges weren't any less real. I was no less autistic. It was just less obvious. Right? 
which is why I get to the Y of the water bottle. Okay, they're over here. Okay, great. May I give you a water bottle, Meredith? Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to pass around a couple of, let's see, I have to, can I give you a, a can? Okay, I'm navigating the stairs now. Okay, so which says something. May I give you a can? Of course. Thank you so very much. Okay, hold on. Do, to do, to do. She cuts cross country. <laughs> Ma'am, may I give you, give you a bottle of water? Okay, free water. All right, hold on. And then we have two. Boom, boom, okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, this is, this is harder in heels than you would think. Okay, <laughs> sir, can I give you a, um, a cup of a fountain drink? Fabulous. Oh, chivalry is not dead. Thank you, thank you so much. Let's see, um, who's somewhere far away? Okay, ma'am in the fabulously burgundy kind of tights. May I, get, yes. <laughs> May I come across and give you a fountain drink? Here you go. If you like Pepsi, I think it's Pepsi. Okay, here you go. Thank you, got it? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, you guys are good sports. Doopy doopy doo. <sighs> okay, <laughs> now let's pretend I didn't just give those to you, okay? <sighs> you happen to have them. We're going to notice people with your water bottle, with the water bottle. Can you just kind of like hold your water bottle up? Look at the water bottles. No, that is not a water bottle. <laughs> that is okay, we laugh with you, not at you. It is all good. <laughs> Which is a social rule that nobody really gets. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, so we have water bottle person, water bottle person. Hey, everyone, do you notice that they have water bottles? Yes, we do. Good, good. Yes, we notice you have water bottles. Okay, I have a question for you. Beyond just noticing, and you can put them down. Beyond just noticing that you have a water bottle, let's think about this. If I just observe and I said to you that people, let's pretend that the two of you all are people who I have noticed all the other diagnostic criteria that go along with deciding someone is on the spectrum, okay? Okay, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and a water bottle. That's what goes on. Okay, here's the thing. I noticed that you have a water bottle. But you know what I'm not doing as a diagnostician, psychologist, whatever, whomever, whomever's doing the actual diagnosis, right? And I know we've all heard it, like you're not this enough, you're not that enough. A neuropsychiatrist once said to my daughter, or to me, when my daughter was little, she's not weird enough. So, you know, I don't know, maybe weird is a compliment then, who knows, right? Um, they don't, their job isn't to figure out why. They're just noticing, hey, these are the things that when you put them together, like letters, you put them together and look at that, it makes a word. Yeah, okay. Their job isn't to ask why. Hans Asperger really should have done the asking why. People now who are experts, who are researching and coming to understand and discussing autism need to do the why, and this is why the why of the water bottle. Hmm. If I were to ask you, shocking, I'm going to do research now. If I were to ask you, ma'am, why might you have a water bottle with you. I'm thirsty. Okay, you have a need. It is thirst. And the water will do what? Quench my thirst. But bam! Mm -hmm. This has not been planned. This is entirely spontaneous. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and that's exactly it, right? You've got a need and you are filling it with said water. Thank you very much. Here is my next question. Not the water bottle. Hold up the tea. There we go. We have, do we, we have two, two teas, right? Yes. Okay. We have now, question. Do those things look like water bottles? They are not transparent, are they? They are not filled with, they don't have a blue label going around or a little teeny cap on the top, correct? They are instead tall cans. Yes? Then a white. Nice. Like it. This is good. What do you have there? Uh, <laughs> Is it a bit? Razzleberry tea. Okay. <laughs> that sounds pretty good, actually. Yeah. And you have? A refreshing Arizona iced tea. 
let me refresh it. You'll love it. All right. I like you. Okay. So, all right. So we have beverages, right? Yes. Tea. Okay. Um, what do you have, sir? It's like cola. It is. In a what? In a paper cup. A paper cup. And do you have cola also? She's drinking it. So yeah. No, you weren't. No. <laughs> oh, okay. It's fair. It's fair. <laughs> She's like, I don't, I'm getting called on in front of all these people. I don't want to say maybe it's root beer. Get... Okay. Would you agree that it's like cola-ish? And it is in a, is a cup. Look remotely like the water bottles. No. Do the cups look like the metal soda containers? No. I mean, they're tall, but other than cylindrical. But other than that, no. Question. Why might you have a refreshing Arizona iced tea? <laughs> I need to quench my thirst. <gasps> Sir, why might you have a fountain drink in a cup? Uh, I need the caffeine to stay awake. This is also fair. But <laughs> oh, you want that? Because I'm thirsty. Okay. You have a need, which is thirst. You want to quench the thirst. Same as the dang water bottles, right? It looks different, right? It looks a little different, right? You could have it in this thing. You could have a glass. It could be yellow and it's lemonade. Who knows? Whatever. The point of it, and, and I'm sorry that I've now left some of you with beverages. Uh, <laughs> um, perhaps put it by your feet or something like that, and I don't have people to come around and take them. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, okay. But do you get the idea? You can have the same need, and you can find different ways. The behavior is, the behavior is, I'm going to do something to see she get rid of this, rid of this need, fill this need, but it can look differently. Shocker! Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you an example. My 15-year-old would kill me if he knew, <laughs> if he knew this were still in here. Yeah, no, he really would. OK. <laughs> um, all right. Let's look on the top. Pokemon, Pokemon trading cards. Trading cards, as an example, give what might the need be? See, this is, this is, this is important. I'm gonna tell you, I, I, let me take one step by, back. What I did out of total necessity, where nobody was pointing to me and saying, you're the link, right? It mattered so desperately. That's one of the big messages here. It matters to be seen as a human being, right? In lots of different ways, but it matters to be seen. I went and I took uh, Tony Atwood, who is now a friend, so the world is really a weird place, um, but he had a good kind of explained bullet point of how Asperger's at the time presented. And he didn't say in men or boys, but essentially it was because every single thing had to do with, like, I don't know if you're aware, of, well, of course you're aware of this, this is, a, this is where you are, but you look at the, you know, the forms that you have to fill out as a parent um, if a child is being evaluated, right? And it's like, does the child line up cars and trucks? I didn't have cars and trucks. People didn't buy cars and trucks for me. That wasn't even a thing. So would my mother have said no to, or yes to that? Of course not, right? Well, I would not have had Pokemon cards, probably, probably. But what I could do is I could go through this list of water bottles, of behaviors that were observed, and unzip them and say, well, what's the need that's being fulfilled with the water bottle that maybe I fulfill with some refreshing Arizona iced tea? Nobody's done that. Nobody had done that. This was literally not out there 11 years ago. That's not very long ago, guys. And so I started looking at things. For example, my son loved Pokemon cards. OK, I'm going to go back and forth between two slides. And, OK, so that's the water bottle. Well, what's the why? He loved the information on them. He loved collecting information. 
it wasn't he was collecting information to do something with it. He was collecting information. The process of collecting information was enjoyable in and of itself. OK, fine, cool. And it gave him a way, if he wanted to, to interact with other people. Right? He could trade if he wanted to um, about something that he knew and was comfortable discussing. My daughter did not have Pokemon, but she did have Littlest Pet Shop. And boy, did she love her Littlest Pet Shop. I see people smiling. <laughs> you, did, you had Littlest Pet Shop? <laughs> That's, uh, feel free to talk back to me. It's OK. I won't bite you, I promise. <laughs> yeah, um, and she knew every fact about every one of those Littlest Pets. But if you went into the psychologist's office, they had all this like geek culture stuff around. You didn't see any Littlest Pets. You saw Pokemon, right? He loved Blue's Clues, like loved Blue's Clues. Like he wore only, yeah, see, I have, there are fans in the audience. You will appreciate when I tell you that Santa one year was asked to bring a handy dandy notebook. Santa does not disappoint, but Santa had to work really hard that year <laughs> to find a handy dandy notebook. Santa scored, thank you very much though. <laughs> But he would only wear striped shirts for like a year, OK? Mm -hmm. He loved it, would, would absolutely you know, recite big sections of Blue's Clues shows, right? And if I got them wrong, I mean, I look, he would look at me like I was the stupidest human being that had ever walked on the planet, right? You know, right? Well, all the Barbie movies, every single one. I see people nodding to that, too. I enjoy that so very much. Um, my daughter knew every song. And ev to this day, she said to me recently, again, she's about to be 19, OK? And she said to me um, something or other, oh, I think that would be a nice name for a little girl if I ever have a daughter. But then again, I'm pretty sure that that's from Barbie and the 12 Dancing Princesses. And I said, oh, is it that you used to watch Forever Girl? And she goes, oh, yeah, remember? And then she goes through. The alphabet, where it's like A for Adora, I'm just messing, messing, this is wrong, but like Adora, B for, you know, Blair. B was Blair. C, you know, and she promptly recited them. And this is going back easily 12 years ago, right? And what is that? That's, the, again, the organization of information, but it's a lack of, it's a respite, not a lack of, a respite from, a, a rest from um, the anxiety of spontaneous social interaction, OK? Um, go back. There we go. And yes, the costume. <laughs> or shall we say the uniform. Um, he was very proud. Don't mess with him. That's his badass face right there <laughs> is what that is. <laughs> when, you, when you're four or whatever, that's it. Um, and he took himself seriously, so seriously. But in that, it had to be in costume, right? And, he, and why, why not? Why not? If you misunderstood who he was trying to be, you know, if you, if you didn't understand all the things that he stood for in his uniform of goodness and all, then you were probably just a bad guy, as the world at that point was just good guys and bad guys. Okay, who do you think she's being right there? Can you, anybody guess? Go ahead. Um, like I love you already. Go ahead. <laughs> I know. I know. Or someone being neurotypical. Okay, what was the first answer? A it is a costume. It is a, it is an, it is a costume. So can you tell what costume she is? That was a poorly asked question. I'm sorry. Yes, it is. It is. It, can you tell at all? She's got, I'll give you a hint. She's got like eyeliner that goes up to this. Okay, yes. I love that you said that because that's what everybody said when she went trick or treating. But it was. It was close. Okay. She said Cleopatra. Yeah, you said Cleopatra. Uh, yes? Would you say I couldn't Absolutely. I'm so sorry. So the question was, what, do you th what costume do you think that she was being, right? The answer was Cleopatra, which is what everybody thought, because it was this gorgeous costume, Halloween. Uh, and, and when people would say, are you Cleopatra? And I would just stand back and wait for the lecture. <laughs> 
Isis. Isis, the goddess Isis. Is that what you're... Because uh, every, like, 10-year-old kid is Isis, right? <laughs> and then goes into the whole story for each house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you unzip... And, and so what was that about? It is about finding... It's, it's not so much, I think, I think, about hiding behind something as it is finding parts of yourself to reveal in ways that feel comfortable. That's, that's me. Plus, it's just fun to play dress up, but whatever. Um, but if you notice, ask yourself the why question, and things look a little bit different. How are we on time? What, and what time do we have till? Like now, you're telling me probably, right? Oh, golly. <laughs> Okay, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go fast. We're gonna get to a part where I'm gonna tell you, like, this is seriously important information, but then I'm gonna give you a website where you can download it for free. So at least you'll have that, because, yeah. And so, point, point also being that is my now um, about to be 13 year old. Um, he was the only one of mine who lined things up, and that's his, what he, how he decided to decorate Barnes and Noble. Um, I did not line up cars, I didn't have cars, but also just a thing. When you play with cars and trucks, like don't they go in a line? Doesn't traffic go in a line? And this is just a question, but okay. I never noticed it, but. Yeah, well, yeah, I may, and maybe, so there's maybe that, but who knows? It could just be that it's just a thing that I've noticed and there's nothing to it. But for a lot of other kids, it's about displays and tableau. And so it's not necessarily that you are lining things up but you are putting on display some of your most precious items in a way that you, that in some way it's like parallel play. It's saying, look, look at my things. They matter. No, you may not touch them. And if you do, you will, I will be very unhappy, but here they are, right? And it's not a line, but it kind of is. And that's where I came up with what I now call the checklist checklist. I went through every single one of those dots in the bullet. And I did a, okay, what could the need be behind this? I unzipped, what could the need be behind this? And if that's the need, what might I be doing? What might I have done to fill this same need with a refreshing iced tea? And I could go through every single one, every single one. And it was only because I could do that that the doctor had to say, you know what, yeah, that makes sense. You are on the spectrum. And so it wasn't just their dad, it was me too. <laughs> and that was one of the biggest gifts of my life. You know? Um, okay, this is the part that is like, I hate to say like, this is the part that was important. Everything you just sat through was, you know, Nothing, that's not true. <laughs> um, but this part, the checklist checklist, at the very end, I'm gonna give you a website where you can download this for free, okay? So that way, because this is like the important, yeah, okay, I'll just go really, for like, this is the portrait of the unique ways we do autism. This is also in the book, Autism in the Heels, which by the way, because some people might prefer this, also is an audio book and also just came out in paperback. I don't know if you have the paperback versions or the hard copy, okay, hard copies. Yeah, the paperback just came out. Oh, guys, can I tell you a thing? This is not a humble brag. This is a yay us. Um, um, okay, so the books, because it just came, came out in paperback, it's like up for new awards and stuff, and that's cool. But you get picked to one of the, you know, one of the best books, of, best autistic books, like top 10. Best Asperger books, top 10. Hmm, that's great. Best memoirs, not Spectrum-y, just best memoirs. So there. <laughs> Thank you, right? Like for all of us, like that's a for like yes, because because that's a thing. Like yay! Oh wow! Again, as I said, human spectrum. Check that out. Okay, so so um, these are the ways that if you unzip, like I did, if you unzip those bullet points, the ways that you see that uniquely that um, girls and women. Again, I'm using those broadly. Tend to present when it comes to autism, acting in um, as far as, instead of acting out 
or uh, navigating the complexity of, of female friendships. <laughs> um, it's actually, research has shown, so, okay, I'm gonna have to do a little visually thingy here. Okay, so what research shows is one of the reasons it is harder to notice that girls are having a harder, hard time socially is because as a general rule, like if you're looking at, um, if this is the social behavior of a neurotypical male-ish, right? Okay, neurotypical male. And this is the social you know, behavior of a spectrum male. Well, diagnosticians are looking for girls, women, to then present, shouldn't it be? Let's compare apples to apples, right? Like, because they should also be about on that same tier. That's not apples to apples. That's like water bottle to iced tea. Um, what happens is actually that because the nuances and complexities of female friendships are so much more inter intricate, sorry, sorry dudes, like I'm not trying to be, they just are. Um, and I could explain and be really like specific as to the whys of that. It's not a judgment, it's a thing. Um, you have to be much more profoundly impaired as a woman to be identified because the typical, we, we, we those of us on the spectrum who are, are or identify as female, tend to um, perform about the same level as a neurotypical male. So that doesn't look autistic enough. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So there are literally like, and I know I'm late. So there are three, I just wanna show you, there are like a couple of pages of, of bullet points. There are so much, this talk can, can go on. Um, but you'll see, we are much more likely to gather and memorize information as we can on social rules, right? Mm -hmm. There's a reason my book on se the secret book of social rules, um, that book is now, and this is important to say, when I started writing this book, which I did, I wrote it um, right after I was diagnosed, my first book was in production, but yet had not come out yet. I started taking down notes about, oh, like, ooh, that's a social rule, ooh, that's a social rule, ooh, for myself, right? Because I was stepping in it all the time, but now I had a reason, so I could do something about that, and that was cool. Except, um, it turned out, my, my psychologist said to me, she goes, you know, you really should turn that into a book. And I said, do you think nobody would ever read that? 90,000 copies later, 90,000. I, that thank you, but it's not for a snap. That's for like, I'm so mind blind, guys. Like, wow, we really do all need this stuff together. You know, we really, really do. We're not alone. Um, but we tend to study things like that. So oftentimes we'll read biographies and um, that's a, to study a way of being. We are much, much, much more, much more likely. You, I'll let here, you know what, if you're taking pictures, you're taking pictures of, of the screen? Yeah, do you want to take a picture? Go ahead. Take a picture, and then I'll go to the next one. That's fine. Like I said, you can get this for free. So, oh, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So, there, I'm gonna, I am gonna go ahead and go through. I can show you them afterwards, but, okay. This is what I just wanna say to you. Despite education or intelligence, despite unmatched levels of creativity, of soul-piercing sincerity, or analytical genius, Women on the spectrum are the most likely to find themselves under or unemployed, financially dependent, and without guidance. For those of us who spend so much of our lives just beyond that magical place of easy friendships and happy, happy hours, we spectrum gals are often still outside the outsiders, still knocking on the door to be let in. But normal and typical, are not synonyms, they are not, okay? If I said to you, this is a really important, this is a really important, do I have any, is there anybody of color in the room? Yes, um, but I don't mean to pick out, it was, it, it, I like to make a point if I could. Um, imagine I'm standing here with someone who is of color, okay? And I said, because as opposed to my color, which is transparent, um, 
Is it typical in the United States to be a person of color? Is it, is it typical? Well, typical has to do with numbers only. It is less typical to be a person of color. That is numbers only. But if I said, is it abnormal? That's a big difference, isn't it? You could hear it then, okay? Abnormal, that's judgment. That has nothing to do with numbers. Normal and typical are not synonyms. So when it comes down to it, what's it like to be a girl on the spectrum? We're too much, so says the world. Only I say the world is wrong. Autism needs more pink, maybe some lipstick if you feel like it, you know. Throw in some piercings or sensible pantsuits because the truth is I don't really care how any one woman does her own version of female. I don't. I don't care what you began as. I just care who you think you are. And as long as we get to be part of the club, because it shouldn't take like it did for me, like it does for the people who come in and follow me into the bathroom, half a lifetime to discover your beautifully different truth. Every one of us deserves more than a life repaired in retrospect. We deserve full human lives on the human spectrum right now. Does anybody know this? It's my tattoo. My, it's a semicolon. Thank you for asking. It's a semicolon. And among other things, it means my story is not over yet. Okay. That's exactly right. So I say raise your voice and sing in cracked tones and perfect pitch. Open the music of your wondrous, wonderful heart. And you, I promise, you and those ruby red slippers, you will be a masterpiece. I thank you so much for having me with you today. These are the two websites if you want. If you want to take a picture for your for the websites, this is so this is just my homepage. I know it says Jennifer O'Toole author. I have to update that. I, 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 as I often say, Jennifer Cook, formerly Cook O'Toole, same ginger, different name. Um, <laughs> And this is, this is the one where you can get the free download of that entire checklist, uh, check, checklist, checklist, checklist. I'll get it out. Um, and it's completely free. Like, I'm not going to bombard you with weird emails and things like that, I promise. OK? And um, is that it? That is it. You guys were an amazing audience. Thank you so much for having me with you. Um, truly, it was, a, it was a, privilege, a privilege. So thank you, guys. Thank you so much. And congratulations on the work you're doing here. It's amazing.